Every day, you know, when we engage with nurses who are trained abroad, they say they want to give back, but when they've looked into the process of getting a license, it's just too much. I have a confession. I never wanted to be a nurse. My destiny changed completely when I saw uh, a poster by Johnson & Johnson. The caption read, be a nurse, dare to join the ones who care. I saw that picture, I marched straight to the nursing department, and I changed my major on the spot. Little did I know that at that very moment, I'd made a decision that will completely change my life. Dr. Yvonne Kumado Mensa is the president and co-founder of the Ghanaian Diaspora Nursing Alliance, GDNA, whose mission is to foster a sustainable collaboration between nurses in Ghana and the diaspora. She's a cardiovascular nurse epidemiologist and an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. She is a fellow of the American Heart Association and was awarded the Martha Hill New Investigator Award in 2016. She currently is the CEO of African Research Academies for Women, a nonprofit organization which seeks to address gender disparities in STEM across Africa. You know what, nurses in the UK, Canada, US are able to do so much more than our nursing colleagues in Ghana. And it's not because they are not bright or don't have the, the knowledge. Welcome, guys, to yet another exciting episode on your favorite podcast in the whole wide world is the FNF Catchy Dialogues. Today, we've got a very special guest. We will allow her to introduce herself. Hello, I'm Dr. Yvonne Commodore Mensa, I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm also president and co founder of the Ghanaian Diaspora Nursing Alliance, or GDNA. It's good to be here with you today. Wonderful. So, it's your host, Frances. Doc, your nursing journey. You've, you've mentioned so many things. <laughs> and I think to, to the ordinary nurse watching out there, it will look like an impossible task. Mm -hmm. Would you give us a breakdown how the journey sort of started and then what inspired you to get to this point? Okay. I have a confession. Okay. I never wanted to be a nurse. You know, there are people who grew up saying, I want to be a nurse one day. That wasn't my story. Um, so I went to high school um, in Ghana, Wesley Girls High School, Gehe Girl. Hey. Yes. Gehe, yes. <laughs> um, so then I had the opportunity to take the SAT, the exam, mm -hmm. and uh, I got a scholarship to come to, uh, to go to the US to study. And I was supposed to be a business major. So I had this idea that when I finish college, I'll go back home and run my dad's family business. Okay. Yes. And so my destiny changed completely uh, when I saw uh, a poster by Johnson & Johnson. And it was a poster of a black woman, an Asian woman, and a white man. And the caption read, be a nurse, dare to join the ones who care. Wow, I know. I saw that picture. I marched straight to the nursing department and I changed my major on the spot. <laughs> I know, it's the craziest thing. Someone will say, well, that's rather impulsive. Yeah. But um, little did I know that at that very moment, I'd made a decision that will completely change my life. Although my grandmother was a nurse, mm. um, here, so rest in peace, I never considered nursing, but really that... Uh, poster spoke to me and that's why they say representation matters yeah i saw the picture of the black woman in the middle and i thought you know what growing up i used to take care of my um nephews and nieces yeah. so if, in, if anyone had a baby i was one of the first people to show up so deep down i had that trait of wanting to care for people and yeah. I just didn't realize it until I saw the poster. So I graduated from Fairleigh Dickinson um, University in New Jersey. I did the traditional BSN program. And while I was in the program, I had the opportunity to um, do a senior honors thesis. So that's when I got exposed to research. Okay. So I did a literature review. And this is interesting because when I was in nursing school and I did research, I said to myself, I'll never do anything with research. I hated research, I thought it was boring, um, but when I had that opportunity to 
really work with my mentor mm -hmm. to um, be exposed to research, how you conduct a literature review, how you ask a research question, and how you go about answering it. That really got me interested in research. So after I graduated, I worked as a cardiac nurse okay. um, in Virginia. And uh, as I was working as a nurse, I realized that when you think about or the patients who would often be uh, re-hospitalized, yeah. they were often black patients. Mm. And so that begged the question, like, why do you often see black people being discharged and a week later oh, with heart failure thing. coming back, yeah. right? What was going on? So that's when I got introduced to this notion of what health disparities, yeah. right? So differences in health outcomes around um, across populations. And these differences are not natural. Mm -hmm. These differences in health are due to what we call social determinants of health. So yeah. working as a nurse, I thought, you know what, this is great and all, but I want to have a larger impact. So I had this crazy idea to apply to Johns Hopkins University. And uh, if many of you know, it's the number one you know, school of nursing. And I almost talked myself out of it. I said, there's no way they would want me, right? But I thought, you know what? How will you know? Yeah. You know, people say, hey, shoot your shots, right? Yes. How will you know? Um, you won't get rejected if you never apply, right? Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and applied and and I was interviewed and I, I started the program actually very early on. So most people will want to work for 10, 20 years mm -hmm. before going to do their PhD. But I had the opportunity to do this in my late 20s. And wow. really, um, like I said, uh, it's really changed my life because after I graduated, um, I'm now you know, a nurse scientist at uh, the number one school of nursing in, in the US. I have the opportunity to uh, design and lead uh, clinical trials, uh, working in collaboration with other scientists, physicians, nurses. Uh, but because of that exposure and what um, I was able to do in the U.S. and knowing that back home you have nurses yeah. who are not able to do as much. No. Right. So I bumped into one of uh, the faculty at Hopkins, Dr. Matilda Decker, and we started chatting and uh, I realized she was Ghanaian. And then I said, I'm also from Ghana. And we realized we both love Ghana and we yeah. both love nursing. And we said, what do we do with this privilege? Because working at Johns Hopkins, University and the number one, you know, school of nursing and being affiliated with the health system was a privilege. Yeah. So how do we take that privilege and how do we collaborate with our nursing colleagues in Ghana, right, to uplift the nursing profession? Yeah. Because, for instance, when I was in Ghana and I had malaria, um, the physician said, oh, I have to leave uh, because I have to go and start a patient's blood transfusion. And wow. so my question was, don't you have a nurse? Why are you the one to start yeah. the blood transfusion? And his response to me was, oh, because nurses are not allowed to do that. Wow, in wow. Ghana. In Ghana. So this was several years ago. Uh, it was like almost 12 years ago. And so that got me thinking that there's so much more nurses can be doing. Yeah. And But in order for them to do that, we need to support their training. Yeah. And so that's how GDNA started. It started as this idea that you know what, nurses in the UK, Canada, US are able to do so much more than our nursing colleagues in Ghana. And it's not because they are not bright or don't have the, the knowledge, it's how do you train them, right? And so we also want, don't want to assume that we have all the answers. No. So we were able to partner with um, nursing leaders in Ghana. And after a series of conversations, we said, let's legitimize this interest. Let's form an organization and mobilize Ghanaian nurses. And you don't have to be Ghanaian. We have Nigerian uh, nurses, Cameroonian nurses who are part of GDNA. Anyone who's Ghanaian at heart. Yeah. How do we all lock arms and link and advance nursing in Ghana? Great, great, great. So just before we go into proper detail with GDNA, talking of your nursing career, you mentioned a key point with regards to mentorship, which played a very significant role in you getting to the point you are today. Were there any personal attributes that you think um, helped you as well, like confidence, anything that was important that helped you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I'll say that growing up, I mentioned that I like to take care of, you know, little children. I also like to teach. 
Great. So growing up, um, if I had homework, I, I would always get into trouble because my mom would come home and rather than do my homework, I'll gather the children in the neighborhood and I'll be teaching them. I had a board and I'll be helping them. So again, little did I know that I love to teach. Yeah. I love to educate. Um, but the other thing is that I just naturally, I, la- I, I, I like to ask the question, why? And that would always get me in trouble because my older siblings, if my dad said no to anything, they would say, okay. <laughs> but I would say, why? Yeah. You know, and I'll ask my dad a million questions until he explained why he made that decision. So I will also say that naturally, I like to ask questions, right? And I think that's a key attribute of anyone who wants to, to pursue a career um, in, in uh, nursing, um, but also research, right? Yeah. Being able to ask thoughtful questions, but also having the guts to to try to answer those questions. Great. So you've you've done quite a number of research studies in the U.S. So I went to a conference um, where they had researchers from all over the globe, particularly um, just engaging the public, telling them about why they need to engage in research. And there was this PhD student from Uganda, uh-huh. and she mentioned something that tickled my brain. She was saying that for most of the research studies that come out, like with regards to drugs and talk of anything, most of those researches are done on either Europeans or Americans, and that is enforced on Africans. What is that gap? Is it that the companies that sponsor these researchers are not interested in running the researchers in Africa? Or what? what, what is the yeah. problem? Yeah. I think you're alluding to this issue of lack of diversity in research and clinical trials. Yeah. And that is a significant issue where, like you said, um, for a lot of the drugs that are currently prescribed, um, the trials that are used to determine whether these drugs are safe and effective, um, often you have very limited representation of mm-hmm. black people. So what are the consequences? Well, it means that if a black person is prescribed this medication, they may say, well, I, you know, because this wasn't tested in my you know, population, it may not work as effectively, right? But I also think that it's because of issues surrounding mistrust and how we educate people about research. Even with my research studies, when we go in the community and we say, we're doing this research study to understand African immigrants' you know, um, awareness of cardiovascular disease risk factors, they'll say to me, hey, research. You know, um, I don't want to be used as a guinea pig, (laughs) right? So we haven't done the work of educating the public about what is research. And if you're testing a drug, like what is the process? And knowing that you're not selecting this population only, right? And unduly exposing um, a certain population to certain risks, right? So I think education about research, research is important. But we also learned this lesson during COVID, right? So the vaccines, there was an issue of vaccine hesitancy because a lot of the trials um, that were conducted to test the COVID-19 vaccines, um, most of the trials were not conducted in Africa. And Mm. you think about the populations that were recruited, one of the challenges is they may say, well, it's hard to conduct trials in in, um, Africa. It's not impossible, Mm. but they're not made to, in terms of the regulations, to do the work of, of recruiting people from these settings. Yeah. It's just easier to recruit people from the UK, US, right? Because those are the populations that they have um, um, access to. But it's a complex issue, but it's important because if we want to prescribe therapy and drugs, we wanna make sure that uh, we're recruiting the diverse populations yeah. so that we can indeed say that, you know, this population is just as, uh, or this medication is just as effective in any um, given population. Great. So I read an article online where it says that you've managed to ha- uh, come to an understanding with the, is it the NMC in Ghana so that it will help reduce the restrictions with regards to nurses in the diaspora registering back home. Um, can you highlight it a bit? Absolutely. So um, when we formed GDNA and we started meeting with the leaders uh, of nursing in Ghana. And I mentioned that, you know, I'm faculty at Hopkins. I want to give back, I want to teach. And then they said, well, you have to be licensed as a nurse in Ghana first. 
And so my first question was, how do I go about being licensed in Ghana? And then they said, oh, you actually have to take an exam. You have to, you know, volunteer for uh, several months before you can get your license. So just imagine how prohibitive that is for any nurse who's just trying to give back. So um, we expressed concern. We said, yes, we recognize that every country has its own regulations and policies that must be adhered to. But then we also said that if you have someone who's, let's say, a nurse practitioner in the UK, who's not licensed in Ghana, but has like 20 years of experience, to ask them to study for an exam, take an exam and volunteer for three months before you give them a temporary you know, license is really limiting. So if we really want to mobilize all of these nurses and midwives all over the world to come and give back, how do we eliminate some of these roadblocks to make it easier for them to give back so that someone like me can really go back home and teach mm -hmm. our nurses about research, how mm -hmm. to, you know, conduct trials, right? How to come up with a research question. And so um, we are really grateful that the NMC uh, was willing to go along in this journey. And so this didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you saw the pictures in the article about the MOU signing, but the actual process took at least eight months. Wow. From the time we said we want to do this, we established a committee, a formal committee that included representatives from the NMC in Ghana and representatives from our Education and Educational Policy Committee. And our, that committee um, is led by Dr. Daniel Apau. Mm -hmm. And so this group met every month um, for several months to come up with language for the MOU to discuss, you know, what is reasonable, what is unreasonable, mm -hmm. is it a temporary license? And so that culminated really in the MOU signing this year in January in Ghana. So that's one of our proudest accomplishments because every day, you know, when we engage with nurses who are trained abroad, they say they want to give back, but when they've looked into the process of getting a license, it's just too much, mm -hmm. right? So it's really limiting. And so we're hoping that in collaboration with WCEA and Dataflow and the NMC, we can really streamline. That's what we're trying to do. Streamline the licensure process to make it as easy as possible for folks who are not trained as nurses in Ghana to become licensed in Ghana. Great. So the aim of, just to clarify, the aim of GDNA is not to get all diaspora nurses no, back home, the, but then through the platform contribute their quota to yes. the motherland. Yes. I'm so glad you asked that because um, there's this misperception that, oh, GDNA exists to bring all the nurses who run away back home. No, <laughs> right? That, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to say that of all the nurses and midwives, and there are different buckets of people. There are people who are trained as nurses and midwives in Ghana mm -hmm. who leave for different reasons. Yeah. And when they leave, we shouldn't vilify them. No. Right? Sometimes people are leaving because their working conditions are not safe mm -hmm. and they deserve to work in safe environments. Mm -hmm. They may leave because maybe their partner has moved right to the U.S. and they want to join them. So we shouldn't vilify them. So, But when they say they want to come back or when you have people like me, right, or second generation Ghanaians, you know, um, yeah, Ghanaian nurses who want to contribute, how do we make it easier for them to serve Ghana? And ultimately, through that service, if we, I always say, if 10 to 15% of Ghanaian nurses and midwives in the diaspora commit to sharing a little bit of their talent and skill in the next five to 10 years, nursing in Ghana will not be recognized because think about the wealth of experience, expertise that they will be bringing back home to help train our nurses and midwives. Great. So um, what benefits do you, the diaspora nurse get from GDNA? There are many benefits. One is that um, you get to be part of a community and a family. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you move from uh, Ghana to the US, UK, you know, you lose your social support. You know, the friendships that you've nurtured over years, you move to a new environment and you don't know anyone, you don't know how to navigate, you know, the, um, you know, the nursing profession here. You gain a community of people 
and there are Ghanaian nurses here who've lived here for 30, 40 years. You, we heard from the yeah. former president of the RCN who spent more than 40 years here. So you think about the wealth of knowledge, expertise, and the connections that someone like her has. So if you're thinking about maybe going back to school for your master's or you're thinking about career advancements, you're looking for a job, that has actually happened through our platform where mm -hmm. some of our GDNA members have said, oh, I need this position, or someone has posted a position and connected some of our members to people looking for um, looking to hire. So that's one of the benefits. So community, right? Career advancement, right? Service. We are really big on service, right? Ghana has given us so much. Everything we are and have is because of Ghana. Yeah. Right? When you think about it, yes, there are issues and, you know, uh, but we don't want to focus on the problems. We want to be the solution, right? So we think that this also offers a platform for people to give back, to serve Ghana, because this is not just serving Ghana. We, you know, when you say that, oh, you're serving Ghana. Our families live back home. Yeah. Right? So if healthcare is better, it's better for everyone. Exactly. If you go back home, God forbid something happens to you, you want to know that the nurse who's taking care of you is the most qualified, has access to the best resources. So that's the vision that we have, that every nurse who's trained or midwife who's trained in Ghana is highly trained and can work any and everywhere and can practice at the highest level possible. Wonderful. So membership for GDNA is obviously diaspora nurses. Is it? It's not restricted to Ghanaian nurses, no. but anyone who has Ghana yes. hat. Yes. So I get excited because GDNA was officially launched in Ghana in January of 2023. We're less than two years old. Mm -hmm. And in this short period of time, there are almost 1,800 members wow. all mm -hmm. over the world. Cool. And like you said, they're not just Ghanaians. We have Nigerian nurses, Cameroonian nurses. We have Ghanaian nurses in Saudi Arabia, in mm -hmm. China, mm -hmm. you name it. We want to ensure that in the next five to 10 years, you can find a GDNA nurse in every country, right? Great. So again, this is because of the level of impact that we want to have, right? But by building this alliance, this community of not just individuals, but also organizations. And we've been fortunate to collaborate with key organizations, even here in the UK, the Ghana Nurses Association, yeah. they've been great collaborators. From the time we started, they never said, oh, you know, you guys are trying to compete with us. It's like, no. There's a lot of work to go around. How do we lock arms? How do we link and collaborate? So that's just one example of collaboration that, you know, you don't actually have to be African too. We have people who are not African who are GDNA members. Yeah. It's open to all and anyone who has, what, Ghana at heart. That's what we like to say. Anyone who wants to see the nursing and middle free profession advance in, in Ghana and beyond. Great. So... Um, Finally, is there anything that you would expect from the public, like um, so groups, um, government, or organizations to support GDNA with? Oh, this is one of my favorite questions. So, uh, so GDNA is a nonprofit organization. And if you know anything about nonprofits and how they operate, we rely on the generosity of individuals and organizations you know, we are also applying for grants mm -hmm. uh, to support our mission. One key example uh, I'll provide um, shortly is um, we had a, a nurse or a midwife in the UK who was going back home um, for a vacation. And we said, as you're going and you're there, can you train midwives in perennial suturing? So this is a perennial uh, a midwifery uh, specialist in the UK who gave up her time. She brought her mannequins and kits and we were able to train 23 uh, midwives. And we were able to raise about, what, $2,000 by just sending messages. We organized a, like, a fundraising page. We sent it to the link to people in our networks. And within a span of a week, we were able to raise 2000 almost $2,000 to cover the kits so that the midwives can use it to practice. And they were so grateful. Uh, and we know that that's going to make a difference because yeah. By training a midwife to suture correctly, any woman who um, gives birth or um, 
is going to be sutured is going to receive the highest level of, of care, yeah. right? They're going to do it well. And the things that they learned that they didn't know, right? And so that's our way of giving back. So we see that if you care about, you know, improving healthcare or nursing and midwifery in, in Ghana, please visit our website, www.gdna.org. The website again is www.g-dna.org. And there's a donate button. Uh, like you said, um, every little counts, yeah. right? Um, it doesn't have to be this large amount, but together if we can mobilize resources because there's so much we want to do and there's only so much that we have at this point because we're a new organization so if you know our mission touches your heart um and you want to support um please do yeah so guys um we we can't end this conversation but we have to end this conversation because of time factor it's been a pleasure having um doctor with us um any final words doc and then we wrap up this conversation so I'll, in conclusion, I'll say that um, whoever you are, wherever you are, if you are a, a nurse or midwife and you're watching this, uh, just remember that uh, you have Ghana in your DNA. And if healthcare improves, if nursing improves, it benefits us all. And the business that we're in is a life and death business, right? And that's the simplest way to say that, you know, you never know the impact that uh, you're going to have, not just on a stranger, the, the quality of care, if it improves, it improves for all of us. So uh, please join us, please support us. If you're not a member, membership is free, right? And we're really committed to ensuring that um, anyone who can benefit from all the webinars. So we have webinars that we offer um, for free. Um, and that's one of the benefits. So please join us if you're not a member. If you have the means to, uh, please feel free to donate uh, to, to support our mission. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Great. Thanks so much, guys. So just go to that website. Membership is free, as you said. Try to become a part of the family. And then you can follow us, um, GDNA, on LinkedIn, um, their website as well. There's a YouTube page also where there are some webinars on there. You can watch some videos and then if you want to connect there are so many people interesting people doctor is available for mentorship and for counseling and any career guidance for yourself um, thank you for staying with us to this point tell people about fnf catchy dialogues and until we meet in the next episode it's peace